Whoa. You ready? Ah, we'll see. Okay. Hey everybody, this is Chris uh, from my YouTube channel, Chop with Chris. This is my first edition of Chat with Chris. <laughs> I have with me Matt Cremona from Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's a great YouTube channel. Matt, you just want to introduce yourself real quick? Fantastic. I'm, I'm Matt Cremona. I love your channel. Thank I love you. what you do. Always inspiring. Get me out there and get energized. So we actually do YouTube videos, kind of like the same kind of like theme. We start with trees and logs and stuff and, and make stuff out of them. Yeah, the difference is, is I, I use everything. I use no electrical power <laughs> tools and you use every power tool imaginable. Some imaginal electrical. From wenches and trucks and <laughs> five foot long chainsaws. <laughs> I do have saws bigger than your chainsaws, but yours are a bit more efficient, I think. Oh yeah, depends uh, how much gas you have in the can, right? Well, I'll tell you, when the zombie apocalypse come, <laughs> you know, you're all going to be coming to my house, so. Oh, I'll come here. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. So, but we thought, I thought we'd just take the time to talk about um, our philosophy on, first of all, woodworking, our, and then our philosophy on, on YouTube and, and how we run our channel. So, you just want to talk a little bit about your philosophy, your approach to woodworking, how you got started, uh, why you do what you do, and, and um, you know, what, what, what are some key learnings you have for people? Sure. Um, I started uh, woodworking about uh, eight years ago when I was in college. Um, my girlfriend, who's not my wife, she wanted something from Ikea, and I thought, no, I could probably make that. I could probably make it better than, than what they were selling. And uh, that's a slippery slope because <laughs> I tell you what, you start down that road, you're like, I can make this, I can make that now. And then you just start making more things and then it just really just consumed my life and it became just an absolute passion of mine, just uh, woodworking. And as I got more and more into it, I started developing like a more of a keen interest in more finer woodworking, um, a lot more like higher precision joinery, interesting joinery or traditional joinery, things like that. How did you learn those, that just trial and error? Did you take some classes or, because I've seen some of your work, it's amazing. So a lot of time in the shop. Okay. Um, for me, the best way for me to learn anything is to get out there and just do it, uh, practice, make mistakes, fail. Um, anytime you, you have an opportunity to fail, that is the best learning experience you'll ever have because you can learn yeah. so much from that one failure. As long as you have your fingers and toes, that's, that's the key. Yeah, yeah, as long as you do it safely. You know, yeah. just, if your work doesn't turn out the way that you expected it to, you just kind of have to analyze what went wrong and then just try it again. Yeah. You know, if you make that, if you're, if it doesn't come out the way you're trying to, you have in your mind and you just try doing it exactly the same way again, chances are it's probably not going to turn out any better. But if you modify what is wrong with your technique or what's wrong with what you're doing, you can usually kind of improve things and you'll be a little more motivated to actually keep doing it. That's the other thing too, is you have to kind of keep motivated with it. So if you can somehow just kind of keep at it and just stay motivated and just like celebrate the small victories in yeah, your own exactly. work, then you won't get discouraged and you'll keep, uh, keep at it for a lot uh, longer. That's great. Well, I, I started woodworking about 10 years ago and I started with a really ugly bowl, as you saw. That was not ugly. It, it, it looks well, it looks it like- a, It was it looks, a nice piece of wood. It looks like a cow's stomach. That's what my <laughs> wife says. Um, but as some people know, um, after I made this crappy bowl, it's all I could think about that night was the next bowl I was mm -hmm. going to make. I mean, I couldn't even sleep. I was thinking, how am I going to make the next bowl? So I started going to flea markets to find tools, and I made another ugly bowl, but not look like a cow's tongue, this one. But I just started to progress. It's all cow parts. It, it, cow parts, yeah. That's, that's true. That'd be a great t-shirt, wouldn't it? Cow parts. I don't know. Anyway. But um, then I, I just started to progress and do more and more. And as you said, I, I made a lot of mistakes. I have no formal training. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I actually don't want to get formal training. I just want to learn and make mistakes and, and succeed. You know, like I said, it's a small victory. So, so my, and my philosophy has always been is how do you spend the least amount of money possible? Uh, you know, I do buy my carving tools because I can't find the flea markets, but most everything else yeah. in here for the most part came from a, a flea market and I refinished it or from an auction. And I've also built a lot of my own tools mm -hmm. that you've seen just because I enjoy the challenge. Um, yes. So yeah, it's always about the challenge and overcoming and succeeding. I, I often wonder if, if, if I did have formal training, if it would, it may not be quite as fun because I, I feel like perfection is a waste of time. I mean, I, <laughs> it, it really, I mean, you can make something look nice in your own mind, but, but I know a lot about woodworking is everything fit perfectly together. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, and I'm really impressed by people like you and others that can do it so precisely, but I guess that's not really what's important to me. It's more about 
how the total piece comes together. The, you make an interesting point though. The reason that my stuff looks so good is because I ignore the things that don't matter okay. to make the things you do see look perfect. So okay. that's another thing like, it depends on your philosophy of how you want to work, but I, I know a lot of people get hung up on the small details, everything being perfect, but the reality is if you're not going to see it, if it's not going to affect it structurally, make it imperfect so that the things that matter um, turn out looking perfect. Hmm. So it's like a really good example of this is the Morrison tenon joint. The only thing that matters visually on that joint is the shoulder. So if you've got a perfectly crisp shoulder all the way around, it doesn't matter what's going on, on the inside. So if you had that shoulder undercut at all, that's just going to make that shoulder nice and tight against the pieces joining into into the mortise. So you, you, to the person looking at it, it looks perfect yeah. because what you see is perfect and structurally is good because the, the tenon size for the mortise perfectly or within tolerance. Hmm. But it's undercut. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. No. Now, what's the holy grail of something that you haven't made before, but you really like? That's the holy grail of something you want to make. Ah, uh, I would really want to make a um, like a Bombay or a serpentine chest or a, a Bombay secretary. So, I'm, I'm, what's a Bombay? Is so that it's a like desk? Is Bombay it? is a style. So okay. the the Bombay style is like if you're looking at the the front view of a, like a chest of drawers, it comes down and then like balls out and comes back okay, and like okay. that. And does the same thing on the front. So it's a compound curvature. Okay. So the front curves out and the sides curve out. So the drawers are like really wonky looking, okay. but it's incredibly challenging looking. And I like challenges. Like okay. as you're mentioning earlier, it's all about the challenge. And for yeah. me at least, if I wasn't challenging myself, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be fun. I wouldn't be learning, I wouldn't be progressing. Now you're in the process now of building a sawmill, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm making a, uh, a really wide cut bandsaw mill. Um, it'll cut around like maybe five and a half feet. I don't have it, the guides in yet, um, so it'll probably be around five and a half feet of cut width when it's all done. Something like that. You mean you can, you can bandsaw a five and a half foot diameter log? Is that what, yeah. is that, what that means? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I told you already that I'm going to make a foot powered bandsaw. <laughs> it probably won't be do it, be able to do five and a half foot, but it'll be able to do maybe you, a foot or two. You can make it yeah. do it. You just be there for a yeah. long time. Just yeah. pedaling away. But yeah. you've seen the flywheels I have. I got all kinds. That's of That's true. You can get good. some serious momentum going. Yeah, I get. I get. It's, it's not so bad. Once you when I made my foot powered lathe, I was doing it for like the first sixty seconds. Mm -hmm. I thought it was the worst idea I ever had. <laughs> I, my, I mean, but I got warmed up and it, then it worked pretty good. But yeah. but uh, you know that's why you try those things. You know. I guess yeah. that once you get the rhythm to it, it's probably not exactly. too bad. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You have to have rhythm to start with, though. Yeah, I'm, I don't No, that's I don't. okay. I don't know. So, <laughs> so okay. Um, I had a question about your channel. So I okay. think you and I have different philosophies. Well, we're in different situations. I I do this as, as like a hobby. Um, I have a full-time job. Mm -hmm. You do this full-time. Yep. So, so I'll start with me. Um, I generally do projects that, that I want to do. I think your son is dropping stuff on the floor upstairs. He's a cute guy. He He's probably great. is. Yeah. He's having a blast up there. Yeah, and JR's having a good time. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Mary, we're trying to film down here. Okay. No excuses. Um, but I generally do things that I'm inspired to do. Either sometimes my wife will ask me to make something. I will get suggestions, but generally I'm driving down the road. I see something, I hear something, and I just go do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that happened with the foot power lay. That happened with the carving bench. Some of these other things I have, um, the bowls I make. And so I do monetize. I started to monetize about three years ago. Um, I only monetize because other people were ripping off my stuff and putting it on Facebook. Yeah. And YouTube would, you know, run ads. And so I just thought I would do it. So it's not, you know, the main driver of my of my channel, but it is something I want to grow over time. And, and uh, with some of your coaching, I've, I have an Instagram page now and Twitter, and I'm trying to grow that. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to grow all the areas, and it all kind of feeds together. But, um, but I, you know, when I, you know, I'm probably going to do this. I'm trying to put more time into this. I'm trying to upgrade some of my uh, computer equipment and phot photography equipment. Mm -hmm. He's funny. He's got a big fancy camera. I have a little <laughs> point and click camera. And I've dropped it so many times that the sound doesn't work on it, so I'm actually taking sound into my iPhone and I put it on later. But, <laughs> but mine's pretty, my approach is a bit haphazard, and one of the one of the things 
that I don't do enough of is you, you should put out content on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And sometimes my projects are big, but I haven't done that historically. And I think that's why my subscriber base is around 70,000. I only get about five to 10% of my subscribers view every one of my videos. So, and I think it's because I've gotten subscribers, but I, I'm more at the bottom of their queue or they subscribed when one of my videos went viral on Reddit and they've never subscribed again. So I have kind of a transient channel. So, I mean, it's what I've set up, and I think I need to do more things regularly when I have more time. But, but that's kind of my overall approach on my channel. Mm -hmm. And how about you? A little different, but kind of the same kind of thing. Is when I first started my channel, I was doing it for fun. Um, and I knew, like, just like you, my projects aren't like, I can do this in a week and have a video that same week, and right. I knew that wasn't going to be possible. Um, so I, I do have my project videos, but I've also filled the... Um, I guess the the video list with um, like technique videos and just like answering question kind of videos. Those always do really well. It's really well received. Um, for those, I'll take requests because like my Ask Matt series is just I answer a question from a viewer. And then every week I have my shop update, and that's my way of keeping people up to date with what's going on in the project. You get a lot more detail from just staying current with those shop updates than you do just watching the actual finished um, project video because. You know, with, with YouTube videos, you kind of have to keep things going. You can't go on all these little tangents about, like, why you design something this way or that way. But with the with the shop update, like I have, I can have that time to explain my thought detail, process. Because people are, are expecting it. Yeah, exactly. They expect okay. a little more detail there. So you actually see the thought process, like, this is why I picked this piece of wood for this part, or this is why I decided to design it this way for this function, or, you know, whatever. And that's a great way for me to keep. Um, people up to date what's going on and to keep the channel current with the piece of content. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I like to do a whole project, then do a fast motion all together. And then I started to do a couple years ago is do a fast version and a how to version. And mm -hmm. the fast version, I've had a couple videos go, I call it viral, but I've had a couple <laughs> that got 100,000 views in an hour. That's my definition of a viral video. And so that happens yeah. when you get on some place like Reddit. But Reddit, you're not going to get that with a how-to video. Mm -hmm. You're going to get with something that's very fast-paced. But but Reddit's very fickle. <laughs> First of all, I got kicked off of Reddit. Is you really? Yeah, because it's not proper reticent to post your own stuff. I didn't know that. Depends on the subreddit you're posting to. I think. Well, yeah, but like our videos, our videos, they don't like. I didn't know this. I didn't. Someone said, "Why don't you post it?" Reddit. I was like, "Okay." <laughs> and so I had one post Reddit, went crazy, another one, and then they, I got kicked off so I think I'm back on but I'm I just don't post them to our videos but but other people do mm -hmm. but um but my my but what I'm finding is is in terms of building my channel I get much when you look at the source of my subscribers most of it really is coming from the how-to and the education because I think YouTube is the greatest education oh yeah platform in the world and I think the how-to videos have the best long-term approach and I do I still like doing the fast ones like when I made my my scroll saw, I did mm -hmm. a fast version, and that did very well in artisan videos. Oh, yeah. Reddit. Yep. But I'm going to do a how to version, and it'll probably get more. But, you know, in that case, it you need know, a big spike, and then it goes to zero. So, you know, once you get, once you get into um, more how to, they're more long lasting. So, but you, you're able to generate regular views from your shop updates. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, and so people are coming back every Thursday. And do you feel a lot of pressure to get a video out every week? Um, yes and no. I mean, I try, I kind of set my own little, I don't know, content schedule for it. Um, this past summer, I kind of took the, the summer off as far as spending a lot of time making content. I did a lot of planning for this fall because I've noticed that really the viewership in the summer just, oh, yeah. just tanks. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of hard. Like the summer before, I actually like put out project videos and the project videos take me the longest to produce, both making the project and then actually all the editing that goes into it. So I thought, well, instead of spending, you know, whatever, two whole days editing a video, it's like 15, 16 hours to edit a video, I can be out doing something else, getting ahead on content for the fall, yeah. or planning my bandsaw mill build. I yeah. put a lot of playing time into that. So that's kind of how that went. But as far as, like, I try to put, I, ideally I'll have a shop update and then something else that week, either an Ask Matt or whatever, log milling video or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I try to do that every now and then, and then I think what I come up with is like an actual like feasible thing is like 
a weekly shop update, and then like three other videos a month. Hmm, okay. Something like that. You know, I, I hate when I'm, like I get inspired to do something, I hate when I have to do, when I'm thinking about the next video or think I gotta get a video out because I just feel pressure. Because mm -hmm. this is so like, for the love of it. <laughs> I mean, so if it, if I ever feel pressure, then then it's not fun anymore. Mm -hmm. So I, I do, I mean, I do get a lot of requests for videos and people are telling me, you gotta put more content out. I want longer videos. and. I guess you just have to do what's best for you, you know? Yeah. I love you guys. I love all you out there, okay? I love all you men and women out there, but I just don't like the pressure so much. I don't want the pressure. I just want to enjoy it, so, you know. <laughs> it is a very high-pressure thing, though, because you, you know there's people out there that really enjoy yeah, you what you're to, doing, and you want to, like, keep feeding that joy. Yeah, you want and, it satisfying. And the, at least for me, like, the, my favorite part of the whole process is when I hit that publish button because I know that I've put a lot of effort into this video and I'm really excited to share yeah. this thing with all of the amazing people that watch my yeah. videos on a regular basis. So, Yeah, I love, I mean, I, I have, I answer every comment, except when I get trolled, but I don't, <laughs> I, I don't hardly ever get trolled. Now, I, I don't know, I mean, I know other people on YouTube I know do get trolled more for various reasons, but I don't personally get trolled very much. I mean, like, I just, I don't know why. And lots of times if, if someone trolls me and I don't, remove it other people jump in and start attacking them mm -hmm. the problem is that sometimes it gets pretty bad yeah. and then you have to take the string down but but do you get trolled very much no maybe like maybe once a month yeah it's, it's a, into just some like off the wall thing and you're like i don't know if i can actually take this even seriously yeah so it's like i just ignore it now sometimes people and i try and ignore it and it just goes away but sometimes i mean i don't we remove a lot of comments but sometimes people are just looking for you to yeah. to do something and it's like just oh my God. So. I don't get upset very easily, so good luck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's nice that when you have a channel, you can pull them or do whatever you want, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, what else you want to talk about? I don't know. This is, this is an awesome place, by the way. Yeah, so you this is here. your first time in the Chop with Chris shop. This Wasn't is all that you expected. I mean, uh, it's very surreal being here. <laughs> like, like. You're on the other side of the glass. It's like, it's almost like. I keep, like waking up from a dream. Or, like, oh, man. <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> you have this like you like you know in your mind what it's supposed to look like, and then you step into the actual space, and you're like, "This is so. This is what it's like. It's it's and all, all its real. glory. It's all real, you know. And, you know, <laughs> I'm really happy how it turned out. I was telling them that when we when we this house was unfinished when we moved in, and basement we finished half. The other half is mine, and so I was able to kind of tailor this. It's not a big area, but when you don't use any, you don't need extra room for like the power tools. Yeah, no, you got more. plenty of room in here to work. You could do yeah. some big projects in here because you yeah. have a lot of like, unlike me, I like, I have my space and I've packed it like as much as possible. Yeah. So I don't have room to actually do projects most of the time. It's like, if I actually want to do like a big project, someone's got to get moved yeah. because I, that was kind of like the last, like I can put all these tools everywhere, but then I like, then think about what if I want to build a chest of drawers, where's that thing going to yeah, go, exactly. you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I'm going to be in northern Iowa this fall, and I have to get up and yeah. check, out, check out your place. Not too far a, from northern Iowa. We can do a, a chat with Matt. Yeah. You know, something like that. So Do some so, logging. Yeah, we can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can. You can hope that sawmill be it. Well, when do you think you'll be done with your sawmill? Um, I'm hoping to have, like, the blade on there and turning by, like, the first week of October. Before Maybe the snow like, comes or? I, I, don't know, I hope so, but yeah. the snow doesn't really scare me or anything. Yeah. I'm still out there in the dead of winter doing something yeah. crazy, so. I love cold weather. I just love it. I don't, but I, I still I well, deal with I grew it. Up, I grew up in northern Iowa, and I had a paper route when I was 10 years old. <laughs> and I would beat the snow plows out. I'd put those, oh. the, and this is before Gore-Tex and stuff. Talk about cold. But I do enjoy cold. I really enjoy being outdoors, so. Yeah, I just like yeah. being outside, so whatever, you know, you dress for the weather. Yeah. You don't have enough body fat on you, though. I do have that problem for real, yeah, though. Yeah. It's like I don't have any body fat, and then the cold is it's rough. Yeah. So, I'll, like, I wear Under Armour all winter. All right. Oh, was that a, a, a sponsor? Uh, it should be. Yeah. You should sponsor him, Under <laughs> Armour. He, you know, you really should. So. All right, well, listen. Hey, Matt, thank you so much for coming Thanks by for today. Thanks for having it's me. It's great to meet your, your wife and son, and uh, um, we'll see you in Minneapolis or see you at the next woodworking show. Yeah, looking forward to it. All right, great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Me. This was Chat with Chris, episode one. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Cool. Uh -huh. That's pretty good.
I hope so. It was recording. That's a good sign. <laughs>